crowd. Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me in the back? You guys, I'm having a hard time. I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm going to, I'll zoom in. Um, I also have tickets for the December 19th uh, festive Christmas dinner uh, yes. next week. So if you need tickets yes. and need to pay. I already got well, I got some people are on top of things. I could come back with my checkbook and my <laughs> I believe cow, afterwards, that's right. I believe afterwards it will be in the choir room. So, because we're going to let the choir people do it. So, okay. so that's here. So, um, so we're uh, coming to the end of our Genesis study, and we're going to really fly through these last few chapters, obviously. But it's helpful because the Joseph narrative is, is really the most complete um, coherent of all of the narratives of the ancestors. Um, in fact, the story has been called a novella uh, because it is the most coherent of all of the narratives. It has a beginning, it has an end, it has plot, uh, there's, there's characterization, there's, there's drama. I mean, as opposed to, say, the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, where it's more episodic, right? Here's the story of, of Abraham and Isaac. Here's the story of Jacob and his brother. Here's the, but in the case of Joseph, it is a, it is a build um, kind of a, with an actual plot. Um, now, that's not to say that you don't see some source issues in there, and I'm gonna, I'll point those out as we get in um, where there, there clearly are some source issues. Um, but just to catch us up, a couple of things that are important. Now uh, they, this is the whole company with uh, the whole company with Jacob, journeyed from Bethel when they were still some distance from uh, Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. Uh, Rachel was in childbirth and she had a hard labor. While she was in her hard labor, the midwife said, "Do not be afraid, for now you'll have another son." As her soul was departing, for she died, uh, she named him Bet Oni, which is "son of my misery" or "son of my affliction" or "son of my lamentation." Um, but his father called him Benjamin. Um, which means son of my right hand, technically, but it's a son of honor is the idea there. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Question? Woman in childbirth during a long journey. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The rise of Bethlehem. Yeah. Ring the bell. Yeah, this, this does seem familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is also why um, when, uh, the, uh, when Herod slaughters the innocents in Matthew, uh, Rachel is weeping for her children. Rachel was buried in Bethlehem. And, they pulled it from. and so this is, I'm sorry? That's where they pulled it from. That, well, they, oh, okay. actually they pulled it from Lamentations because when Jerusalem was destroyed during the exile, mm -hmm. that quotation was used as well, that gotcha. Rachel's weeping for her children. And so now that exilic quote has been pulled forward into Matthew. But yeah, that's, her, her tomb is in, her tomb is in uh, Bethlehem, which is why Leah gets to be buried in the family tomb with Abraham and Sarah <laughs> and Isaac and Rebecca. So Leah wins at the end of the championship. Uh, she gets buried with, she gets to be his wife in death, if nothing else. Um, Rachel died, he was buried on the way to Ephra, that is Bethlehem, and Jacob set up a pillar in her grave, it's the pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. And you know what, it actually is, so even, <laughs> this was written, I've been there. Um, well, there's a, there's a site that commemorates the site of Rachel. You know, you, there's all sorts of money to be made on the tourist trade, so, you know. Our Lady of Our Church of the Lady Who Wiped the Lord's Nose. You know, you can, you well, my first thought was archaeologically speaking. You know, is there something there that can be dated? There, there is something there. That's as far as I'm going to go with that conversation. But uh, that dates back to when we discovered we could make money by putting these places on the site. Um, real quick, uh, Reuben uh, has sex with Bilhah, um, which you might recall was Jacob's handmaid, or well, Rachel's handmaid, I believe. Um, and so that comes into the story later on. He's, he's punished later on. Yeah, there's all sorts of problems. Uh, the sons of Jacob were 12. The sons of Leah, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun. Sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. Sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid. Dan and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maid, Gad and Asher. So that's the rest. I, and by the way, finally Isaac dies. We've been waiting for Isaac to die for a while. He finally crosses the finish line. Uh, Jacob came to his father Isaac in Mamre, uh, Kiriat Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac resided as aliens. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. You know, for a guy who doesn't have any big stories about him, I find it significant that he outlasted Abraham. Um, he actually lived five years longer than his dad, which is, I don't know what that means, but I think it's interesting that he didn't have any dramatic stories, but he does 
does cross the finish line there, old and full of days. Oh, and uh, Esau and Jacob came together to bury him again. So again, not being chosen doesn't mean you're ostracized. Not being chosen just means you're not the one to whom the promise is going to come. God still provides for the not chosen one, and Esau and Jacob come together and, and bury their father. So Jacob settled in the land where his father lived as an alien, the land of Canaan, and this is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers, and we'll put that in parentheses, or in quotation marks, and was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wife. Joseph brought bad report of them to their father. It's always one kid, you know, one of the... The, the informer who's telling the parents what all the other kids are doing. Um, younger siblings, am I right? Um, now, Israel loved Joseph more than, we can call him Israel. We don't call him Israel a whole lot, but he gets called Israel quite a bit in the Joseph story. Israel loved Joseph more than any other children because he was a son of his old age, and he made him a long robe with sleeves. Now, I just ruined everybody's childhood Christmas or, uh, coloring Sunday school pages with this. Um, coat of many colors is a translation of this. Uh, he made a coat with many colors or long sleeves. It is more likely long sleeves than it is many colors. I thought it was Technicolor. Uh, it was not Technicolor. This completely screws up the musical. I, I can't help, you know, Andrew Lloyd Webber on that at all. Um, either way, it is not a coat to work in, is the point. Um, this is a, a coat of honor. So he gets, he, he's not going to be doing any work. That's why I said he's shepherding with his brothers. His job of shepherding is to go back and tell dad how, what the brothers aren't doing right. Um, in this. So he's not working really at all. So you know what that does with the rest of the siblings. Not only is he loved more by Joseph, or by Jacob, but he's not working. Uh, when their father, brothers saw their father loved him more than all the brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably about it. Uh, <laughs> once Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more because this is going to help the relationship. You know, <laughs> Listen to this dream I dreamed. There, were, there we were, binding sheaves in the field. To which point the brothers would go, we? Really? We were binding? Were we? Uh, suddenly, my sheep rose and stood upright, and then your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheep. His brother said, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. It gets worse all the way through the story. He had another dream, told it to his brother, saying, look, I've had another dream. The sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What kind of dream is this that you had? Shall we indeed come, I and your mother and brothers, and bow to the ground before you? Forgetting, of course, his mother's dead at this point. So his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the, that matter in mind. All right, so you see what's... Joseph's really kind of a snot, I'll be perfectly honest. His 17-year-old Joseph is pretty darn proud of his situation and is lording this position of power. He thinks this is great. He's going to have power and position. He gets to lord over it. That's significant for the later on in the story, by the way. This is snottiness here. Uh, so we have the time Joseph uh, went after his brothers, found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let's kill him, throw him into one of the pits. We shall say a wild animals devoured him, and we shall see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, so Reuben apparently, even though he has raped Bilhah, is trying to make up for it in some way. He delivered him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of the hand and restore him to his father. So after raping Bilhah, Reuben's hoping to play both ends on this situation here and bring Joseph back to his dad so that his dad won't be angry about the fact that he slept with his uh, handmaid. You getting all this family dynamic things going on here? There's a lot happening in this story. I mean, this is a, talk about psychological dysfunction. Um, so Joseph came to his brothers. They stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, or many colors, if you prefer that translation. They took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty, and there was no water in it. Um, and nothing like abusing your brother to make you hungry. So they sat down to eat. <laughs> and looking, now here's where I, I said before that the story of Joseph is the most coherent of the narratives that we have of the ancestors. It's the one with the plot, the beginning, the end, all the way through. It's not so episodic. You're going to start to see some sources, though, creep in as we look at this. So real quick. They sat down. Looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, resin on the way down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he's our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. And when some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. So who did they sell him to? Midian the Midian Ishmaelites. The Midian Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelitianites. Yes. So, so 
How many, how many pieces of silver? Did 20 Jesus pieces of silver. Judas? Judas was 30. So, okay. yes. Yeah, so, he's, Jesus was worth more than Joseph. Well, inflation by the time. It's like 1,700 <laughs> years. But, yeah, so, so you see a little bit of the sources coming in here. Midianites, Ishmaelites being redacted together. There's a couple of places where those, those sources kind of creep out at you. Reuben returned to the pit. So, apparently, he left at some point in this. Uh, we don't have that information. Saw Joseph was not in the pit, tore his clothes, returned to his brothers, and said, the boy's gone, and I, where can I turn? So again, he was all in for this for himself. His goal was to make himself look better so dad would forgive him. Dad doesn't forgive him, by the way. His is the tribe that's pretty well cursed at the end of the story. Uh, then they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, dipped the robe in blood. They had the long robe with sleeves taken to their father. And here, here's great. This is one of those times I'm sorry we don't have Hebrew, because what is going on in this story around the word to see uh, the word for to see or to view um, is is being played with in Hebrew on this because you know you don't you don't lie to your dad penalty of, of death in the Torah later on is you know telling these lies so you don't do that so what do they say this we have found see now whether it's your son's robe or not so in other words they literally say look what we have found is look at this to see if it's do you recognize it and he recognized it so he saw and recognized these same thing same words are being used in this. And said, it's my son's robe. A wild animal has devoured him. Joseph is without a doubt torn to pieces. So the brothers never lie. They just brought this bloody coat to dad. And dad jumped to his conclusions. And, you know, it's, can't help that. So Jacob tore his garments, put sackcloth on his loins, mourned for his son for many days. All his sons and his daughters sought to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, I shall go down to Sheol, to the grave, to my son mourning. Thus his father bewailed him. Meanwhile, the Midianites, the Midianites, the Ishmaelites, Midianites. Uh, well, either way. Um, sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. So, how are we doing? Questions, comments, <laughs> concerns, things I can answer? Questions I can answer will limit the number of questions. Are there? No. Well, linguistically, earlier there was a reference to the brothers saying that Kate is dreaming. Yes. And I'm just wondering if in Hebrew uh, that means a person who has dreams or someone who has aspirations. No, it, it would be that they would be talking about his dreams, but now you've got me wondering. I don't have my I don't have my Hebrew Bible handy. Um, actually, I do have my Hebrew Bible handy. The question is, can I find the reference that quick? Um, maybe I can. That's a, it's a good question of what the word dream, how the word dream is there. Sometimes it's the word for visionary, and that's what I'm wanting to check now. Is if it's a if it's like using the word for if there's an uh, internal tongue there. If it's a, what's that? If there's an internal tongue there. Yeah, exactly. If if they if if he is if it's the same word that's used say for prophet. What verse is that? It was about 30. Uh, yeah, it was. It was I don't mean to break up the 37, I guess. Let's try that. Uh, yeah, we only have a 36 on the screen right now. Well, that's verse, verse 36. It was chapter 37, I think. Oh. Um, well, I'm not going to find it now. Anyway, I'll check on that because I'm curious about it myself. What? Oh, wait, here we go. I found it. So his father had kept him a shock, or he answered, go see the flock, and say, what are you seeing? Da, 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 da. Let's go to Dothan. Here comes the dreamer, verse 19. And the word is, behold, in this, uh, it, it, is, it is the word for visionary. It is the word for, it's a, it's a early word for the word prophet, actually. Um, Jose. Uh, so that's a, that's a bad on the English language translation. Yeah, probably. Well, I... It's probably, I don't know, it's probably the closest you can get. Yeah. Well, but it's, it's referring back to the one who dreams. It he's is. been giving all of these, he's been saying, hey, look what I dreamed, look what I dreamed. Right, but I think okay. it's calling them visions, too, which is a prophetic thing. Yeah, so it's not just a, you know, I had this dream, I was an elephant, what's that about? No, that's not the sense. No, it's this, no, you know, one of these yeah. days, I think it's a prophetic idea, and so they're calling him, maybe derisively, um, a prophet of some sort, an early, you know, the Jose, the early prophets. Um, maybe. Yeah. I was going to ask this chronologically that makes him the first prophet that shows up. In the um, yeah, probably directly. Well, although, no, technically, um, didn't one of the, the patriarchs were called? One of them, at some point, Abraham, I think Abraham was, the phrase was used in one, in passing of him earlier. In Genesis. Genesis? Yeah, in Genesis. Okay. It does happen in Psalms, but I think I, this, we discovered it last time, I think, when we were looking in Genesis. I think that's right. Maybe not, but I'll double check. But yeah, it's, it's used here. This would be a good time to find out what's happening to, to Joseph, right? He's just been sold into slavery. He's just gone down. And yet, no, we have an interruption. Chapter 38 comes along, 
and completely interrupts this story. Um, yes? What about the going to Sheol? Uh, he's going to go to his grave without this would be wailing. Everyone goes to Sheol in the mind of the ancients. Everyone goes to the grave. There's no sense of heaven or hell for an ancient belief. They they just everyone goes to probably the closest analog would be Hades in the Greek thought, you know, shadowy existence with no love, no knowledge, no and it, and it takes a long time over the course of the Old Testament to move into that sense of heaven and hell that we have later on. But yeah, Sheol is just the grave. Sometimes they just say the grave, and that would be fine too. Which, by the way, phonetically with no vowels, it looks exactly the same as Saul's name. So that's that's not a good name for a kid, I don't think. If you're gonna, but. All right, this is the interruption. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and settled near a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. This is all very important in the story. I hope you're following. <laughs> he married her and went into her. She conceived and bore a son who he named Ur. Again, she conceived and bore a son who he named Onan. Yet again, she bore a son and named him Shelah. Why are we spending all this time with Judah? We've had like three, at least five years have passed at this point in this story. Scholars for years said, well, this is clearly a, a, another source that's been clumsily redacted into the story of Joseph, and we see that put together. And, you know, it probably is another source, and it probably was edited together. But um, there's a scholar in the late 70s named, uh, a Jewish scholar named Robert Alter, who wrote a book called The Art of Biblical Narrative, in which he pointed out that this story does a lot for the narrative of the Bible. That what it does is it creates a certain level of suspense. Joseph is now left in Egypt. And we've jumped into this other part of the story that creates sort of narrative wondering, well, wait a minute, what, what's going on with Joseph? And so there is, is it an interruption? <laughs> Absolutely it's an interruption. But I think it's, it's stylistically neat in some way that they put this interruption in here uh, as we go. And by the way, it's about to get a little racy, so I'm sorry. Uh, it's the Bible, what are you going to do? Uh, she was in Chesed when she bore him. Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn. Her name was Tamar. <coughs> but Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Well, that's the way it goes sometimes. <laughs> you know? um, we don't know what Er did. We don't know what was at stake. All we know is God got mad. So Judah <laughs> said to Onan, go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her. Raise up offspring for your brother. These were the days, of course, where primogenitor is alive and well. The firstborn son gets two-thirds of the estate. All the other kids get the remaining third. So uh, Ur was scheduled to get two-thirds of his father's estate. Onan would get one-sixth, and Shelah would get one-sixth. Now, with Ur out of the picture with no kids, Onan becomes the firstborn and gets two-thirds of the estate, unless he performs the duty of the brother-in-law. Because if he goes and sleeps with his, with his brother's dead wife, if she becomes pregnant, you mean the dead, dead brother. Dead brother. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'll do it one more time, and we'll try and keep it even cleaner this time. If he goes and sleeps with the wife of his dead brother, that's the way I meant to say it, um, and she conceives and gets pregnant, then the child of that union is understood legally as the child of the dead brother. So that child would get two-thirds of the estate, and Onan would get the one-sixth, and the other, and Sheila would get the one-sixth. Why would you then sleep with your dead brother's well, that's what happened. <laughs> Don't get it of the story, but yes, you, it is a gift that the younger brother gives to his dead brother. That's the best way I know how to say this, okay? So, but as was pointed out, Onan doesn't like this plan. Since Onan knew the offspring would not be his, he spilled his semen on the ground whenever he went into his brother's wife, so he would not give offspring to his brother. So he continues to sleep with her because apparently he doesn't mind that, <laughs> but he doesn't want to give his brother an heir. So, as a result, uh, what he did was displeasing the sight of God, and he put him to death also. That's two down at this point. <laughs> so Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up, for he feared that he too would die. Like, she's killing all of my kids. I don't know what's going on here. But this is bad. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. So, <laughs> waiting for Judah to honor this commitment that he will give her an heir to take care of her. So she's, again, gone back to her father's home. So, we move on in the story. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. When Judah's time of mourning was over, he went up to Tinma to his sheep shearers, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. When Tamar was told, your father's going to Timnah to shear his sheep, she put off her widow's garments, put on a veil, wrapped herself <coughs> up, and sat down at the entrance of Anaim, which is on the road to Timnah. She saw that Shelah had grown up, yet she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He went over to her at the roadside and said, come, let me come into you. That silver-tongued devil. 
Um, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, what will you give me that you may come into me? He answered, the negotiations begin. He answered, I will send you a kid from the flock. And she said, well, I don't have a goat on me. I mean, you know, I can't carry a goat with me. Uh, she said, only if you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, what pledge shall I give you? She said, your signet ring and your cord and the staff that is in your hand. By the way, this word staff that's in your hand is a homonym for the word tribe. So she literally says to him, give me your tribe as well, which, by the way, at the end of the day, he actually also does. That's the kind of artistry that goes on, I think, in some of the storytelling that's just really kind of cool. Anyway, uh, your signet and your cord, your staff that's in your hand. Basically, she says to him, give me your wallet with your driver's license, your passport, and all your credit cards, and I'll hold on to that till you return with a goat. That's, this is what is happening here. So he does. <laughs> he gave them to her. Went into her, she conceived by him. Then she got up, went away, taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. When Judah sent the kid by his friend, the Adulamite, he's not going to go back, right? To recover the pledge from the woman, he couldn't find her. He asked the town people, where's the temple prostitute who was uh, at Anim by the wayside? By the way, the word he uses here is a, a higher level of prostitute, like a vocational one. The word he uses for her was sort of like, you know, streetwalker, and this one would have been call girl, I, I guess, to, I don't know. That, I, I heard with the ranking of that sort of thing, but it is a higher term status-wise. Now, no prostitute's been here, so he returned to Judah. I have not found her, moreover, the town people said no prostitute's been here. So Judah replied, let her keep the things as her own, otherwise we will be laughed at. You see, <laughs> I sent the kid, I, I tried to make good on the pledge, but what are you going to do? About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the whore. Moreover, she is pregnant as a result of whoredom. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. And she would, as she was brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, it is the owner of these who made me pregnant. And she said, take note, please, whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. And Judah acknowledged them and said, she is more right or more righteous than I am, since I did not give her to my son Shelah, and he did not lie with her again. So the tribe of Judah goes through Tamar, the Canaanite girl who dressed like a prostitute to seduce her father-in-law who wasn't giving her in marriage like he promised. And as a result, is in the line of Jesus, and as a result, is one of the four women mentioned in the genealogy of Matthew. Isn't that a great story? <laughs> you don't preach on that one much. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That's all I know to say here. So, uh, But it really does. She just snuck in there. Really, like she just snuck in there. She did, man. She she. Once again, another story of a woman with absolutely no power in a thoroughly patriarchal society using what power she had to get the men to do what the men should have been doing all along. There's several of good stories like that. Well, the way my mother taught it was that... Your mother taught you this story? That's well, amazing. maybe not this particular oh, one. Oh, okay. <laughs> was that the man is the head of the household, but there's nothing that says the woman isn't the neck <laughs> to turn the head. I've heard that a time or two as well. Yeah. Yeah, she's doing everything she can to get the men to do what the men should be doing because the man's obviously not behaving in an appropriate manner at this point. So, uh, and we'll see that with Rahab, and we'll see that with um, Ruth, and we'll see that. Um, well, that's that's about the only good ones I've got on that one. Um, anyway, um, we talked about that. All right. Oh no, wait. This is where we are now. Joseph was taken out of Egypt. Remember him? We jump back. Meanwhile, as our heroes in Egypt. Uh, Joseph was taken out of Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of the Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites? Is that right? The Ishmaelites. Is that what it is? Yeah, okay, good to know. Um, who were brought down there. I love this story. And, and we're not even supposed to care about that. I mean, when the Bible just thinks that's not going to be a problem, just keep switching between Ishmaelite and Midianite, and we're never going to pick up on that. What is the difference? Yeah. I, I wish I knew. I mean, the whole point of it. Yeah, Ishmaelite is a descendant of Ishmael, and the Midianites are from Midian. And I don't know what that means. And there may be, maybe it's a Venn diagram with some overlaps that the original writer would, you know, just move between. But, uh, the Lord was with Joseph. Oh, finally, God showed up. It's been a while in this story. We haven't seen a whole lot of God in this story, but he's here for a second. Uh, he became a successful man. He was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw the Lord was with him. Uh, and that the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. He made him an overseer of his house, put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him an overseer in the house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in his house and his field. So he left all that he had, and Joseph charged, and with him there he had no concern for anything but the food that he ate. That was all he had to worry about. Joseph had it. He was, a, he was the business manager you wanted. You could trust him. Everything was great. 
Um, <laughs> Joseph was handsome and good looking. Uh, well, I don't know why we need two words for that, but uh, he was both handsome and good looking. I'm going to need to figure out what the nuance there is, <laughs> but both things. Uh, and after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me, silver dumb devil. But uh, he refused and said to his master's wife, look, with me here, my master has no concern about anything in this house. He's put everything that he has in my hand. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you're his wife. How then could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph is easily the most moral of all of our ancestors. He has a strong moral compass and is not compromising. And although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not consent to lie with her, beside her, to be with her. One day, however, when he went into the house to do his work while no one else was in the house, she caught hold of his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called out to the members of her household and said, see, my husband has brought among us a Hebrew to insult us. That's an interesting word. I, I want to uh, unpack that in a second. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And when he heard me raise my voice and cry out, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Then she kept his garment by her until her master came home. Then she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought among us came in to me to insult me. Just the last chapter, you will recall, that was the phrase Judah used to Tamar. Let me come in to you. That, that verb, the same verb. So... For years, I've heard people say this was an, uh, uh, she's accusing him of attempted rape. I think she's accusing him of rape. Um, that he came into me, and the word to insult me, this is a tricky one. I don't know exactly what this word means. Uh, because it's the word itzach. It's the same as the name for Isaac. It's a na word that means laughter. It's a word that means fondle. It's a word that means insult. And I don't know exactly what she's accusing him of here, but I do know that that exact verb is what King Abimelech saw Isaac and Rebekah doing, which told him that they had to be married. He saw Isaac making Rebekah Isaac. And, uh, but it's also what Sarah didn't like about Ishmael, because Ishmael could make Isaac laugh. Same word. Hmm. I don't know what's going on in that word. The semantic range of that word is impressive. And, and so, but, but I think it's clear that she's accusing him of rape. Not attempted rape, but in fact, rape in this story. Um, the master heard these words, his wife spoke to him, saying, this is the way your servant treated me, and he became enraged. I'm not 100% sure who he's enraged at because, verse 20, and Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he remained there in prison. If Potiphar believed this accusation, Joseph should be dead. Mm -hmm. By all accounts, Joseph should be dead. He's, he's a foreigner, he has no rights, and he just raped his wife, you kill him. I think he's mad because he has to do something, and he just lost a business manager. I think he knows his wife, and I think he knows Joseph, and I think he puts him in the royal prison. I mean, there are worse places to, I mean, don't get me wrong, prison's prison, but it's better to be in minimum security someplace in North Carolina <laughs> than other places in the world. So, where solitary confinement is when they close the back nine. That's basically where Joseph is at this point. Um, but I, I don't believe that Potiphar believed that Joseph did this, and I think he's upset that he's lost this great business manager in all of this, because he should be dead by all accounts. But anyway, questions or comments on that? But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love, or con uh, committed love, chesed. Um, he gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed Joseph's care. All the prisoners who were in prison, again, you got a guy with some gifts, you use them. Um, whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The chief jailer paid no heed to anything that was in Joseph's care, because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. The dude can rise wherever you put him. He's, he's got gifts, he's got skills, mm -hmm. he's going to do well. So. It's so. interesting, those don't show up in his early days. No, no. At all. Mm -mm. No, apparently being sold into slavery and Must have done kind of like focused that. the mind, I guess, <laughs> a little bit. He's not quite the spoiled little brat that he was. Yeah. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker offended the lord of the king probably at the same time. It makes you wonder what the two of them were doing. The of the but anyway, Pharaoh was angry with the two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was combined. The captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he waited on them and continued for some time in his custody. One night, they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker, the king of Egypt, 
who were confined in this prison, each his own dream. So every now and then I worry the Bible's trying to make a word count. You ever thought about that with the number of repetitions we're getting as we get through here? It just strikes me as a student paper sometimes. Um, but when Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers, who were with them in custody in his master's house, yes, thank you, uh, why are your faces downcast today? They said, we've had dreams, and there's no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God, tell them to me. So he's going to interpret them. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph, and he said, in my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms came out, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I took the grapes, pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and placed the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said, this is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head, restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But remember me when it is well with you. You always make connections in prison. That seems to always be the way things go for people. Uh, please do me the kindness to make mention of me to Pharaoh to get me out of this place. <laughs> for in fact, I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I've done nothing that they should have put me in the dungeon. When the chief baker saw the interpretation was favorable, oh, hey, this guy's, I'm, this is good news. He said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a pole, and the birds will eat the flesh from you. Well, that one didn't go out quite as well as, as the first one did. So um, those finicky dreams. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants, lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants, restored the chief cupbearer to his cupbearing, and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But the chief baker he hanged, just as Joseph had, Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him, as what usually happens with these kinds of situations. So, so again, now insight as well as, as management skills that he's got in this. The dream. By the way, both of our Josephs in the Bible were dreamers. I always thought that was interesting. Jesus' adoptive father and... And Joseph, the Old Testament, both dreaming dreams. I'm sure not by accident that happened. So after two whole years, Pharaoh, I'm sorry, sorry, I'll tell you the joke in a minute. After Pharaoh, two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile, and there came up out of the Nile seven sleek and fat cows, and they grazed in the reed grass. Then seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. The ugly and thin cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows. Um, my colleague, Mike McKeever, does a lot of interpretations of the book of Revelation. And uh, his readings are great. His class is great. Uh, follows a lot of uh, scholars by the name of Richard Balcom, et cetera. And Mike always, <laughs> Mike always has this little, uh, card I think he made a cartoon of this, actually, uh, where Tim LaHaye is the dream interpreter of the Pharaoh. And if you don't know Tim LaHaye, he's the author of the, the whole Left Behind series. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Pharaoh said, well, seven fat cows got eaten up by seven skinny cows. What can this mean? And Tim LaHaye said to the Pharaoh, well, it means that, that these seven cows are going to get eaten up by these seven skinny cows. And, <laughs> and then everyone died, for they believed the nutty hokum theologian. theologian. So, um, so, so yeah, it's just literally true. That's what happens. It's just literal. Well, uh, Pharaoh woke. Then he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. Seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. Then seven ears, thin and blighted, came. And spread it within the thin ear, swallowed the seven. Well, you know, corn doesn't normally eat itself, but here, that's, that's rough. Pharaoh awoke, it was a dream. And in the morning, his spirit was troubled, so he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told him his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer said, I remember my faults today. One, once Pharaoh was angry with his servant and put me and the chief baker in the custody of the house of the captain of the guard. We dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own meaning. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each according to his dream. As he interpreted us, so it turned out, I was restored to my office, and the baker was hanged. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph. He was hurriedly brought out of the dungeon. When he shaved himself and changed his clothes, you can't go to Pharaoh dressed looking just any old way. Um, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream that no one can interpret. I've heard you can interpret. Not I. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So he tells the whole story once again, again, trying to make a word count. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, the seven good ears are seven years, and the dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after him are seven years, and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind, they are seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he's about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, after them, there will lie seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land. The plenty will no longer be known in the land because of the famine that will follow it, for it will be very grievous. 
And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that this thing is fixed by God. God will shortly bring it about. When God says it once, it's serious. When God repeats himself, it's really serious. So Abraham, Abraham, Mary, Mary, Samuel, Samuel, uh, two dreams. It's, it always is very important when that gets that rep repetition. Therefore, let Pharaoh select a man who is discerning and wise, set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers of the land, taking one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt. And he gives them this whole plan about the way he's going to have to handle this, this famine situation. The proposal pleased Pharaoh and all servants, and Pharaoh said, can we find anyone else like this? One in whom is the Spirit of God? So now he's impressed Pharaoh. He's impressed the jailer, Potiphar, Pharaoh, anywhere this guy goes, this guy's got some insight. And so he gets promoted to basically prime minister of Egypt. There's only one tiny little problem with this story. If you read this story in ancient Israel, there is no way anyone is going to believe it. Any more than they would believe. If I, if I wrote a, a fiction narrative and I said, so in 1956 in Selma, Alabama, they elected this black mayor. And, well, you're like, whoa, okay, so we're dealing with fantasy now all of a sudden. That's what we're dealing with? Because there's no way in history that would ever happen. Well, the, the, the Egyptians were among the more racially proud individuals of the ancient Near East. They didn't like the Kushites to the south. They didn't like the Puttites to the west. They didn't like the Semites to the east. And the notion of an Egyptian appointing anyone to this is the idea of Selma, Alabama, electing a black mayor in the 1950s. However, this story is set at a time known as the Hyksos. It, the Hyksos rulers, foreign rulers, 1800 to 1550. The Egyptians had the best home field advantage in the ancient Near East. People could not beat them at home. They couldn't win a game on the road, but they did not get beaten at home much. But one time they did were by these Hyksos. These, the word just means foreign rulers. But they were basically Semitic peoples from the Levant area that invaded Egypt and took over both Lower and Upper Egypt and ruled it for about, well, they ruled the <coughs> northern part, Lower Egypt, for about 250 years. They ruled the whole thing for a little less than that. But native Egyptians, no way they're going to accept Joseph. But these guys, ethnically, wouldn't be that far away from Joseph. They wouldn't have that same racial concern. And so, even though Joseph is unknown in native Egyptian monuments, that shouldn't be surprising because after the Hyksos period, the native Egyptians destroyed everything Hyksos they possibly could because they weren't particularly proud of being conquered by this foreign people, ever. Um, and it's interesting because the Hyksos did not know hieroglyphics were a language. They just thought they were pretty. So you can always tell a Hyksos inscription because it doesn't make any sense. Um, it's just random pictures put together because uh, they thought they were nice, um, which really is frustrating to an Egyptologist because do you just not understand it or is it a Hyksos inscription is really the, the struggle on that. Um, but the setting of Joseph is going to fit right within this time frame, which actually makes it actually fairly historically believable um, in this, as far as the story goes. So, so that... You know, I don't talk a lot about the historicity of these stories, but this is one of those times when the story would actually strain historical credibility were it not for this time period. And backing up a bit, sure. is it the king of Egypt or the Egyptian king that we see these in previous verses? I guess. The previous verses is the king of Egypt. He is the Egyptian king. He's, he, is, he is not ethnically an Egyptian, but he is the king of Egypt, um, and the Bible's not going to make a distinction at that point. Um, 1550 is when almost the first kicks the Hyksos ultimately out of Egypt, it's about 300 years after that that you get the Exodus. Um, so they're native Egyptians. Yeah, Steve? Well, how far uh, earlier is this than when the story of Joseph was written down? Joseph's story is probably oh, when it's written down? Yes. Oh, boy, that's a great question. I mean, written fragments, oral tradition, I don't know. I mean, it's probably written down no later than the exile, but I'm, I have no doubt there were probably some written fragments, and certainly the story was preserved orally for centuries. But probably centuries. 700 years, Easy. maybe. Well, at least. At least. Okay. Yeah, maybe a thousand. So it's just like a distant memory. It is. Uh, it is. But, but the fact that, I mean, it, it is such an unbelievable story <clears throat> were it not for the fact that this time period actually did exist. It kind of reinforces it on some level. Well, yeah. Is that before, would this be before Hebrew became a written language, though? Uh, yes. Yes. So it's strictly oral. It is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it, by the, about the 1500s, it's a little later than that. 1400s, you do see the phrase Habiru, referring to an ethnic people in Palestine. Uh, so it's a little bit after this. The word, I mean, you don't have Israel in it much later, obviously, but uh, but you do have an ethnic people, at least in the, I think about the 14th century, uh, maybe 15th century. That you have you had that wall people. with Ramses' uh, victories listed. Mm -hmm. Ramses III. Third. Okay. Yeah, which would be after the Exodus. Because that's the word after stealing. <laughs> 
Yeah. This is a, a big one. It's three and a half centuries. It is. But did this dating consider from? Yeah. Yeah. So most would date, well, I say most. The, the conventional dating would probably put the Hyksos in the 1650, or excuse me, Joseph in the 1650, 1700 era in that. So right smack in the middle of the Hyksos period. Is this before or after the building of the Great Pyramids? Oh, the pyramids would have been 700 years old, 1,000 years old at this point. Yeah. We are closer to Cleopatra is than Cleopatra was to the Great Pyramids. They were very old. They are way early bronze. Yeah. They were ancient by the time these guys were. Yeah. The, Egypt, the, the uh, Hebrew slaves did not build pyramids. Um, so no matter what those little cartoons tell you, uh, it just didn't happen. Uh, but there's no reference to pyramids. No. In the scriptures, no, right. or no. or Pharaoh either, frankly, which Pharaoh did? Because what greater insult could you throw at Pharaoh than the guy who thinks himself to be divine and not mention his name in the story? And from a, I didn't mean to reach it, but from a point of documentation, like yeah. plate tablets, receipts, right. contracts, mm -hmm. treaties, mm -hmm. is this period just a black hole because the Hyksos are functionally illiterate? There are there. Well, the Hyksos, yeah. Are they <laughs> using? They, there are, yeah, I don't, I don't know what written records we have that preserves a Hyksos written language, because I know most of the hieroglyphic inscriptions are gibberish. So I don't know that they have other means of writing at that point. But yeah, it's, they would it's, need to bring you would think, foreign, uh, yeah, you would think. I'd have to check on that. They're organized in a few features. Yeah, yes. in, in spite of this uh, information on that slide, is it, does it make any sense at all to talk of the historicity no. of Joseph's story? It's I, a story. I, it is just a story, yeah. I, I would say, though, that it makes it historically believable. I mean, what's it? The, the, to them. Right. To some right. of the listeners. To the people, right, right, to the people who are reading this. Because would have, this would have stuck out like that black mare in Selma were it not for this period of history that made it more believable. So yeah, I mean, I think what is it? Uh, Robert Alter in the, in the Art of Biblical Narrative uses the phrase um, historicized fiction for a lot of this. And uh, of course, you have to understand he's very precise in using that phrase because he always says that historicized fiction is the, what the biblical text is because thank goodness it's not myth, um, which always just makes my students go, what? <laughs> because for them, those are the, but he's using those obviously in very technical, technical ways. But anyway, um, let's move forward to the story. Um, Seven years of plenty came, just as, as he said, where are we time-wise? Okay, we probably did skip up a little bit here. Um, the famine was so severe, it affected Egypt and Palestine. It's very rare that a famine is that severe. This would be a massive uh, event, because most of the time, Egypt was able to withstand most of, uh, most of the famines. Uh, I mentioned a few weeks ago, a colleague of mine liked to call Egypt the 7-Eleven of the ancient Near East. It was always open, and you could always get something you needed if you needed to go there, because um, they were always there, they always had food. It was always fine, but not, not here. This is apparently a serious issue. Uh, Joseph, though, had two kids, Manasseh and Ephraim. Um, so the oldest one is Manasseh, and the second one is Ephraim. That's important later in the story, too. Uh, Jacob, back in Egypt now, learned there was grain in Egypt. He said to his sons, why do you keep looking at one another? I heard <laughs> there's grain in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us, that we may live and not die. <laughs> Some of these phrases, what are you all just looking at each other for? Go to Egypt and get us something. So they go down. They didn't take Benjamin. Joseph was governor. Um, Joseph's brothers bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. So there's that recognize again, uh, playing with that same word. You know, recognize really clever storytelling. Uh, but treated them like strangers and spoke harshly to them. Um, so he's going to play with them a little bit because, you know, little brothers. And he got tormented a little bit. And so you got you to gotta do that. Uh, so he messes with them. He uh, gives them their money back. He doesn't know that. They don't know that. They bought grain. Then he hid the money that they paid with back in their bags. Um, and so, let me keep going here. They loaded their donkeys with the grain and departed. When one of them opened the sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw the money in the top of the sack. Oh, my goodness. They're shocked by all of this. Um, at this, they lost heart and turned trembling one another. What is this God has done to us? Then they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They told him what happened, saying, The man, the Lord, spoke harshly to us, charged us with spying on the land. But we said to him, We're honest men, we're not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father, one who's no more. The youngest is now with the father in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, By this I shall know that you're honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me. Take the grain and famine the household. Go your way. Bring the youngest brother back to me. And I shall know that you're not spies, but honest men. Now release your brother to you. You may trade in the land. As they were emptying the sacks, there was in each sack his bag of money. When they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were dismayed. Why are they surprised now? They just found the money two <laughs> paragraphs ago. But again, you get some of these sources being redacted together again that you, that you have this. Well, 
There's no way we're going to take Benjamin, Jacob says. I'm not losing Benjamin to you. I've already lost Joseph. But they run out of food, and they finally decide we're going to have to take Benjamin. And so Judah says, you know what? It's, it's, it's my responsibility for him. I promise that uh, if anything happens, it's on me. Um, Joseph messes with them again, stages this whole thief thing for Benjamin. He's gonna, going to uh, take Benjamin away. And at that point, um, Judah interrupts. And, well, wait, where are we here? Da, 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 da. Joseph was, by the way, Joseph had to hide because he is always messing around with them and starting to affect him emotionally. So he hides it because he's weeping. Um, but they made Benjamin uh, look like he was guilty. And Judah comes to him and says, let me find it here. Should it be found in the answer? Da, 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 da. They quickly lowered the sack to the ground. It was found the youngest. They tore their clothes. Yeah, here we go. Judah stepped in and said, Oh, my Lord, let your servant please speak a word in my Lord's ears. Do not be angry with your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man. Uh, he, he, his brother is dead. He alone has left his mother's children. His father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me so I may see him. So he's telling him the whole story. We did this. But he goes on to say, You can't take him. You can't take him or you're going to kill him. Take me instead. Um, and so when that happened, Joseph couldn't take it anymore. When he saw Judah had finally become selfless in this regard, he introduces himself, uh, reveals himself. They can't believe it. I'm Joseph. His dad's still alive. The brothers couldn't answer. They were so dismayed. Um, and then we move through the story. Um, but I wanted to say a couple of interesting things about Joseph. Um, at the end of the story, we have Joseph uh, selling the food back to all of the people, but the people ran out of money in the land of Egypt. So Joseph started taking their cattle in exchange for the uh, food, and then he took their land in exchange for the food, giving them seed to plant, but keeping the land for themselves. So Joseph basically came up with the idea of enslaving Egypt, which, let me just say, comes back to bite them later on in the story, you might recall. Um, but uh, it was actually Joseph who started this thing. He bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, and all the Egyptians sold their fields because the famine was severe, and the land became Pharaoh's. And it's the people who made slaves of them from one end of Egypt to the other. So it was actually Joseph who enslaved Egypt uh, at this point in the story. Jacob, when he blesses Ephraim and Manasseh, you remember Manasseh and Ephraim? Manasseh is the oldest, Ephraim is the youngest. He switches his hands and honors the younger one over the older one. Um, because, you know, showing favoritism to younger kids has gone so well up to now in the story. Jacob decided to go ahead and continue <laughs> that trend. Um, but he does. Uh, Joseph tried to fix it. You know, it displeased him. So he took his father's hand to move it. He said, nope, <laughs> I'm doing it my way. And so he does. Um, and he reverses those blessings. And then we come to the end. Um, realizing the father was dead, Joseph's brother said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong we did to him? So they approach Joseph saying, your father gave us instructions. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crimes. Joseph does this. This is amazing. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept. Joseph said, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. He comes to understand his dreams differently. He's no longer the arrogant little snot that he was when he's 17 years old. The power that he has given is not power for the sake of himself. The power that he and the wealth he has given is given for the sake of the family and the people. That is the way power is judged throughout the Old Testament. You use position and power for what you can do for Torah and others. And Joseph has come to understand that at this point, using that position for, for others at this point. Uh, Joseph remains in Egypt. He lives 110 years. Um, and he comes to his brother, says, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to you and bring you out of this land, to the land he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Joseph made the Israelites swear, when God comes to you, you shall carry my bones from here. And Joseph died being 110 years old. He was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. And off he goes, and that's the book of Genesis. Um, and so it is actually... Uh, uh, Joseph is is a uh, embalmed and his body is carried out in, in the book of uh, in the book of Exodus with the seventy people that came down into the land, uh, those Israelites. And so, and that one Hebrew man that I said was the virtual Noah. Yeah, um, it does seem to be the most. Is it the most detailed story? Of the probably, and, and certainly in Genesis. Yeah, and it's what fifteen chapters of one story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's probably the longest single narrative like that. Well, I mean, apart from something like the Exodus. Just begs the question, was it preserved because it was so important, or did it become mm -hmm. important because it was so important? Yeah, yeah. And there are plenty of people who will date the story much later, pointing um, uh, wisdom characteristics to it. Uh, the, the, and when I say wisdom characteristics, I mean the, the kind of uh, 
insight that Joseph shows, the life well lived, being able to be an effective manager and, and choosing the good and the morally right path, and very much the kind of instruction you see in Proverbs. Um, so a lot of people base that a lot later, um, yeah, actually. Yeah, it's just too, too old and drafted by now. So. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, I'm saying it's composed later. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. I, I tend to, to see that it probably is a, an earlier, preserved an earlier, I have no doubt it was put down later, but it's, I think it's preserving an earlier tradition, certainly. Yeah, tremendous detail. Were wisdom literature uh, stories, were they influenced by Hellenistic thought? Or were they not uh, probably not, no. They're, probably you, they're wisdom tra- but certainly other ancient Near Eastern thought. Um, yeah. The, yeah. I mean, there's Egyptian wisdom traditions, there's uh, Sumerian, there's Babylonian wisdom traditions. Uh, the Babylonian, there's a, a story called the Babylonian Theodicy that looks very much like the Book of Job that many wonder if Job is not a, a rip off of the, the oh, story, the Babylonian story. Yeah. So, you know, wisdom, if, wisdom, Literature is literature that comes from observing the world and drawing conclusions on how the world works. And it's not like Israel's the only folks who's ever looked at the world <laughs> and drawn conclusions on how the world works. So, yeah. What, yes, what, what would a Jewish uh, theologian say is the key point of the story? Of the Joseph story? Of the Joseph story. Um, we won't slave in Egypt first. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, maybe. The, that they enslaved Egypt first, yeah. <laughs> um, but certainly the, uh, the, the, pr- the preserving of, there, there's a tendency in which, particularly uh, Jewish interpreters, to personify individuals as the nation. Uh, so David singing the Psalms is singing as Israel in those times of suffering. Um, and so they read a lot of the laments that are given as David as personified examples. I think that um, unfair suffering succeeding where you are, still being persecuted, succeeding where you are, still being persecuted, giving these opportunities. I think they would they would probably see themselves embodied in in Joseph in the story. I do. I think it'd be probably the way that would be interpreted. So yeah, just see well, and another idea is bring uh, how good comes out of apparent evil. Yes. That Joseph is yeah. apparently a victim in, in the pit and all yeah. that. Yeah. But that it was part of God's plan. So mm-hmm. we Later interpreters would interpret it as God's providence, yeah. but for the Hebrews, was it more likely an example of God's righteousness? Yeah, that what you intended for evil, God made for good kind of idea, that God is able to redeem your wickedness, you know, the wickedness done against us for, for good. And his chesed. Showing, anytime you see that God showed Joseph his chesed, that is the word that is used whenever God talks about the covenant. So it would be hard not to extrapolate the nation from Joseph in that context. That's a good question. So we've got like five minutes, no, seven minutes before choir. But I do want to say, um, I've enjoyed our time together. Have you enjoyed our time together? I mean, yes. you keep coming. Good. Um, so what are we going to do next is the question that, that I want to ask you. And I've got a couple of options. And since you are the guys that are the faithful ones who keep coming, I thought I would ask you to weigh in on this a little bit. Um, we could do another book study like this, um, um, and certainly the natural one that comes to me is going to be like the Psalms, because I enjoy doing the Psalms, and we could work through, <laughs> work through in the spring. And when I say the spring, you have to understand I'm speaking as a professor, so January to May is the spring for me. Okay, So, so we could work through in the spring uh, through the, for various Psalms, and I would enjoy that very much, and I think that you would enjoy that very much as well. Uh, or I realized that Genesis ends in a cliffhanger, because they all do. Uh, the, the Jewish texts love cliffhangers. Genesis does, Deuteronomy does, Malachi does, Second Chronicles does. Everywhere the text ends, there's a cliffhanger. There's expectation. And, uh, maybe in the spring we could do kind of a, I don't know, a mini uh, Old Testament sort of survey and kind of move through a little Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy if you want to do that. What's that? Can we do Exodus? Well, I was thinking we could do Exodus, but if we do Exodus, then, I mean, it looks like I'm going to cover the Bible in 33 years, and that wasn't really my plan. Um, I mean, I appreciate that, but... Uh, Are there four foundations? Leviticus, Deuteronomy, are there four? I mean, the number four is jumping in my There's head. Genesis, four, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. There's five books of the Pentateuch. We just covered one, so there's four left. Um, and so we could do... I mean, I could easily run through Exodus to Deuteronomy in the spring. I could probably even get a little further than that, maybe Joshua and Judges in the spring. Um, It would be, yeah, it would be that. And, and canonical more than I would say chronology, but yeah, canonically speaking, which is presented in a timeline, so I should probably be fair to that. Do you guys have any thoughts? I like that, the, uh, the core five of the 
Torah? Did they go through the Torah and Would see how far we get tonight? I mean, they were canonized together. They, they were. They were. I like and like the earlier Christians. You like the Psalms? I have a dissenting vote. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you don't want to just. You have to choose. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to pick one. <laughs> the Psalms would give us, I mean, I would, I would have a chance with the Psalms to pick, uh, uh, I would, to be able to pick some things that would represent sort of large, I mean, obviously the book that I'm putting together is reading the Old Testament through the Psalms. So by doing the Psalms, we are going to dip into other parts of the rest of the, of the Hebrew Bible. So, it, I mean, probably if you're thinking of surveying the text, the Psalms is probably a good place to go. I'll join the dissenting. You'll join the dissenting voice with the Psalms? I, I, I like this, uh, I, to the Torah. I don't. Yeah, I've never really, really thought about that. Plus, if you don't do the Psalms now, it'll keep the heat on you to get the book done. That's fair. Uh, that's fair. That's fair. So, You're yeah. saying that we would have to read it? We would. Yeah. <laughs> no, buy it. You don't have oh, to read it. That's right. <laughs> right. How about Exodus then Psalms? Right. Exodus and then Psalms. Uh, all right. Well, why, why don't we do try, that? I mean, I'll, to, I'll uh, start with um, yeah, common ground. We'll start with Exodus and start moving forward in that. And honestly, I think that uh, I could probably get um, I could probably get to Judges by May because I don't. We're going to just dip into those places as we go. Um, I don't want to spend an entire four months on uh, Exodus like I did on, on no. Genesis because there. I mean, don't get me wrong. Exodus is exciting, and there's a lot of really cool stuff happening in Exodus. But uh, by the time you start getting past, I don't know, Exodus 23, Exodus starts reading a whole lot like Leviticus. And I start losing folks uh, on that. Uh, it gets it, you, first of all, God describes how you build the tabernacle, which is as exciting as reading blueprints, and and then <laughs> Israel built the tabernacle, which is as exciting as watching them put the blueprints into action. So it could be covered. More. I could give it a little broader broader picture on that. So so we will do that. All right, fair enough. What I, what I really enjoy about any of these uh -huh. is getting a little more information on. The mind of the people that yeah. were right. reading it. How they would have taken it. Thing. Yeah, that's my favorite. That, to me, I think how, you, how they heard it helps us hear it better. I do. So, let me.